wanted to start by talking about architecture. And I wanted to show you this because I don't think it's very obvious right now. This is the state of building technology today. This is using building information modeling. And it's basically the way that we are designing our interior spaces. And it refers to in interior spaces as technological spaces. And what that means is we have a high degree of control of our interior spaces, our environments. We can tweak the, excuse me, the air, the temperature. We can twe um, tweak the information. We can control all kinds of things in this environment. But when we go outside, we're left in chaos. We're, out, we're in the city now, we're affected by weather systems, we're affected by things like radiation and noise and air pollution. And the problem is we're not treating our exterior space the way we treat our interior space. It's not yet a technologically treated space, yet it has problems that technology could help. Um, this is air pollution in Beijing, and it's notorious for air pollution, of course. Um, my problem with it is that you can see by this picture that the air pollution is an architectural problem. And yet, the buildings are making no reference to it. We have this highly active environment, you have a chaotic space, and the buildings are essentially made of inert materials. So air pollution is made up of many harmful things. The, the most harmful components that you hear a lot about are oxides of nitrogen commonly referred to as NOx, or volatile organic compounds, VOCs, SO2, FPM, they're all really bad for you. Um, there's a technology that we found early 2000s, 2001, that is a smart coating, and it deals with air pollution just using sunlight. And it's, um, it's a really interesting nanotechnology it uses photocatalytic titanium dioxide. You've probably heard about this. It's been in the market for 15 years. Um, and basically what it does is it uses UV light from an ambient sunlit day, and it converts noxious particles. So if we're talking about NOx, it will convert them to nitric acid on the surface, which is immediately um, neutralized by calcium carbonate and you get a yield of calcium nitrate, which is a harmless salt. So you're actually getting a chemical conversion between NOx to calcium nitrate. And the, again, the, the calcium nitrate is, is washed away by rain at the end of the process. And we found this material to be really fascinating, um, but it was formless. It's been on the market as an architectural application, as a paint. And we thought, okay, it's a, air pollution is a formless problem. You have a formless technology dealing with it, but what else can we do with it? So there's a link in the biological world between surface enlargement and light. And we were particularly fascinated by corals. Um, corals have to struggle to live on the ocean floor for light. Um, they're actually skeletal structures, but they have tiny organisms living in the structure. And the way that the coral has to grow in order to survive is by surface enlargement so that it can get light from every direction and it can maximize its reception of light. And we found this idea of surface enlargement to be potentially linked to a light-based technology. And we started to ask ourselves, in the case of the titanium dioxide technology, could surface enlargement enhance this technology? And if so, how can we work with that? So we invented a facade module that reduces air pollution. This is called ProSol. And this basically uses this idea of the titanium dioxide technology in a new way. And what we wanted to do was instead of coating buildings, coating streets, coating cities in it, which we should do, we wanted to cluster this technology and get as highly at the as, as high performance as we could get it onto an architectural device so that we could be able to site it near pollution sources and we could be better effective. So this uh, facade module is actually made of thermoformed plastic. It's a lightweight shell. 
Uh, it's coded in photocatalytic TiO2. And it basically uses surface enlargement to um, increase the reception of light. It uses omnidirectionality based on the pattern that we're using that's a particular geometry um, to collect light from all sides. And it's actually slowing down wind, so we want to create turbulence here to be able to catch pollutants to channel pollution onto the backsides, into the curves, just get the maximum efficiency that we can. And in 2012, we put it on a building. So this is a hospital in Mexico City. This is called the Torre de Espacialidades. Excuse my Spanish. <laughs> it's on the hospital Manuel Hea Gonzalez in the southern part of Mexico City. And Mexico City, of course, has this terrible pollution problem, but almost every global city has a terrible pollution problem now. Um, so this is nothing unique. But we put it on this building as a sunscreen, and it was also meant to address the street in front of it, which is a heavily polluted street. Um, this is a facade of about 2,500 square meters, and according to our recent technology trials, it's reducing the pollution of approximately 1,000 cars on the road in Mexico City per day. It's effectively the world's largest urban air purifier. So this is the technology up close. You can't really see what it's doing. Um, and we give it form so that you can. And somebody told me lately, um, recently, that Shuko, instead of selling windows, should be selling transparency. And this really got me thinking about what we do. And so far, we've been developing building products that link climatic technology back to architecture. But actually, I think more of what we're doing is selling the ability of a building to reduce urban air pollution. And this, is, this is, sounds like a slight change, but it's a big difference um, for us. Because what it means is we're starting to work with soft power. And soft power is, the, is, is a technology that's able to harness or precipitate. And it's, it enables architecture to deal with immaterial problems. I don't know if anyone's read The Martian. I know probably a lot of people have seen the movie, but I don't think the movie dealt with this in the same way. In the book, the central character who's stranded on Mars, and I won't spoil this for anyone, but in order to survive, he has to precipitate water from oxygen. He has to tweak his air. He has to use solar energy in a different way. And this is all a method of survival. And I started to think last year there's real link between the Martian and our own situation with global warming, and that is scarcity. And so you have Matt Damon sitting on what could be our planet in 50 years, and then you have our leaders from COP21 deciding what we should do about it. And this starts the question about global warming and where are, where are our resources going to come from. So one idea is that they should come from the atmosphere. And these are two companies that are focusing on that. This is Fontis. It's an Austrian startup doing air capture to water, which is a water bottle that basically precipitates water from moisture in the air. And the other is um, New Light Technologies. They're working on carbon capture from emissions. And they're basically taking methane emissions and converting it into a commercial plastic. And they're making laptop bags for Dell computers. So our carbon future is pretty bleak. And this scenario, which is now just passed, this was, I think these charts were done just before COP21, so things are even, uh, our goals are even more stringent now. Um, you basically have the red curve up here on the right, left. Um, heading toward our bleak future at five degrees um, global warming rate per year. This is the disaster scenario, but that's the track we're on. Um, any corrective measures, like being carbon neutral or lowering our emissions, will not get us to the formerly two degrees, but now 1.5 degree target set by COP21. And so the IPCC has agreed that what we need are carbon negative processes. 
this is a carbon negative process, and this one is really interesting to us as architects because it's a material process. And what it is is the creation of biochar. And biochar is a, it's a really old technology. It's not really even fair to call it a technology because basically it's just photosynthesis. But what it does is take the burning of biomass, so anything that's absorbed CO2 in its lifetime, any agricultural waste, any, um, it's called stover after the fruit's been harvested from a field. The rest of the biological material can be burned in a pyrolytical chamber, you can see it here, um, into a stable form of carbon char. So you're actually getting atmospheric carbon into a material. And um, this is a tested method. This is the leading method for reducing CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. So what does this mean? This, this is a carbon negative process called carbon sequestration, um, carbon capture and sequestration. And so far we've been talking about carbon neutral when it comes to architecture. We want to balance the carbon equation. We want, um, we just heard about energy producing buildings, which is great, which is kind of more on this end of the, of the um, spectrum. Biochar sequestration means that you're actually taking carbon out of the sky, converting it into a material, and then using it to build. And then when you're done building, you take the, what you've built, shred it, put it into the earth. So you're essentially reversing the carbon flow. Instead of taking fossil fuels, burning them into the atmosphere, you're actually drawing them down, sequestering them, and putting them back in the earth. So we thought this, was, this had real potential as an architectural material. And we started developing um, a material. We call this made from air. And this is a biochar-based bio um, architectural material. These are our first tortillas from the lab. Um, I think they're a couple years old now. And we managed to get 70% biochar in there, which comes to 50% atmospheric carbon. So we're at a carbon negative material. And what this means is anything we make with this um, can have impact. So as it scales up, the more we build, the more we make with something like this, the better off we are. It, it inverts our idea of, of sustainability. It says that to build is actually a good thing, to consume is actually a good thing. If we scale it up, if we get our processes right, um, we can have impact on this problem. So we have a vision with this material to, um, to construct cities from it. We, we see carbon cities in our future. We think that you could build a city essentially from the sky above the city. And in, the, um, in, this, um, in this scenario, we are sequestering about 1,000 kilograms of CO2 per ton of material. And the construction industry is huge. And we just heard some numbers before about um, materi uh, material resource and construction. I think the number I had was 30%. Um, the construction industry produces 30% of the material we produce globally every year. <laughs> so it's um, pretty significant. If you were to add something like biochar as an additive into that process, then basically all of our built stuff, if it had some carbon negative additive in it, would be, we would have a significant lowering of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So this is, as architects, we were interested in, in the building industry, obviously. I mean, we always talked about, why aren't we making iPhone cases? Why aren't we making plastic chairs? Why aren't we doing something completely ubiquitous? Well, we're architects. We like to find form for things. We're interested in aesthetics. Uh, we're interested in showing this material and typifying it. And we want to be able to suggest it as um, a whole slew of new uh, carbon negative materials that we could build with. And this is how we start. So we make a facade panel. And this one is called hex char. And it's, it's a hexagonal facade panel that can be flipped so you get randomness over the facade. And basically, it's sequestering 1,000 kilograms of CO2 per ton. 
Um, and it's a carbon negative facade solution. So for every 1,000 square meters of this that we put on a building, we're sequestering 10 tons of CO2. And to give you a perspective, each person makes about two tons of, sorry, 20 tons of CO2 per year. So it may not seem significant, but if you were to put, let's say, aluminum cladding on your building, you are creating 80 tons of CO2. So the differential is about 90 tons. And I think the more of this, the better, no matter how ins insignificant it seems. And finally, this is some new research we're working on. Um, we're interested in finding out the material properties of this because it is a new thing. Um, biochar is conductive. It has good fire properties. It can be structural in this case. So we're looking at how we can do double curvature walls, making a kind of brick. And then on the right here, how we could possibly tune facades to react with um, acoustic acoustic properties on the street, so how it could work and interact with sound. Thank you. <laughs>